Welcome back to Learn Neuroradiology, everyone. This is going to be our second lecture in our continuing series on CNS autoimmune and inflammatory disease. This section is going to focus on encephalitis. If you haven't seen the first section, which is on demyelinating disease, I'd encourage you to go back and take a look at that uh, at your convenience. But today we're going to focus on encephalitis and the brain. So as I said, we've talked about demyelinating disease. Today we're going to talk about encephalitis. Some of these other things like sarcoid and amyloid we're going to get to in uh, the continuing portions of this lecture, which we'll release uh, as we go along. But today we're going to focus on inflammatory and perineoplastic encephalitis and infectious encephalitis, which can be kind of a mimic of those uh, autoimmune and inflammatory diseases. So the main autoimmune encephalitides that you need to think about are limbic encephalitis and lupus. Uh, the infectious encephalitides, there's a number of those with the most uh, noxious being herpes. We'll cover those uh, briefly as well so you guys can see what uh, the imaging findings of those are like. We're going to start with a 30-year-old male with altered mental status and a seizure. Here you see some images from a patient who's altered. We have a flare and a T2 and a diffusion. You might take a look at this flare pretty closely here uh, when you're talking about someone with encephalitis. You want to think about those medial temporal lobes. So you've got to look at those medial temporal lobes there. You can kind of confirm that abnormality on the T2 in the middle there. The diffusion is pretty uh, pretty normal there. Here's your pre and post contrast. Uh, pre contrast on the left, post contrast on the right here. Not seeing a lot of enhancement there. So uh, enhancement is not a key feature of this. What we're looking at here is a bilateral encephalitis. This is not something for which you can jump to a diagnosis immediately. It's really a differential. The thing, like I said, that you've got to worry about the most is herpes just because the outcomes are so poor. But other viral encephalitides like West Nile, St. Louis encephalitis, those kinds of things, uh, you can think about those as well. Now, limbic encephalitides are often a perineoplastic uh, syndrome. They're often associated with a variety of circulating antibodies that you can detect in, uh, in serum. And so that's something to think about as well. You can have an infiltrative astrocytoma that looks like this, but it'd be very unusual for it to be so bilaterally symmetric. This is a case of limbic encephalitis. This is an immune-mediated encephalitis, which is often associated with malignancy. It can be associated namely with lung, testicular, breast and ovarian cancer, and lymphoma. This particular patient had an anti-GAD antibody, so uh, that's one of the common antibodies, although there's a long list of those which you, you have to think about. Now, the imaging findings that you'll see is, as we saw in this case, is these bilateral temporal T2 abnormalities. You can sometimes have patchy enhancement, but it can be non-enhancing. Oftentimes, it will be symmetric, although don't let uh, asymmetric enhancement uh, worry you too much. Now, compared to this case, herpes encephalitis tends to have greater diffusion abnormalities, more enhancement, the patients are sicker, and these patients need to be treated immediately with acyclovir. So here we'll just review these imaging findings again. What you'll see is that there's bilateral temporal hyperintensities on flare, normal diffusion, just a little bit swollen and a little bit too bright there with really no enhancement. So this is a companion case here. This is a case of chronic limbic encephalitis. So we have a 49-year-old who has memory impairment and a five-year history of seizures. Uh, what you'll see here, these are some coronal images through the bilateral hippocampi. What you'll note is that the hippocampi are, are relatively small, particularly on the left here where the hippocampus is really uh, almost linear there, like, and that temporal horn is enlarged as well. Uh, this is some volumetric software uh, that we use at our institution. It's commercially available. It's called NeuroQuant. This shows you some of the uh, morphometry of the hippocampi and some of the brain structures. We often use it in cases for, uh, for seizure to see how the hippocampi uh, look. So this uh, does automatic segmentation, tells you the volume of the hippocampi. So the left hippocampus is uh, about 23% smaller. And this shows the hippocampal volume against age match controls. So this person uh, here, uh, so here you see like uh, the, it's you know plotted against his age here. The normal range would be from here to here and uh, he's well, uh, well below average there for the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is, is quite uh, small. Uh, here you see the this person is in the first percentile for hippocampal volume, so very low hippocampal volume. This is how it has evolved over time for this patient. You see in September of 2014, 
uh, the hippocampi were just bilaterally bright, kind of swollen there. And uh, within uh, five years, this is actually, uh, so you see a lot of atrophy, continued T2 hyperintensity there. And this patient had an antibody to uh, voltage-gated potassium channels. So that's why this patient was having chronic encephalitis. And over time, they've really lost their, their nearly their entire hippocampal volume. A chronic autoimmune encephalitis, as in this case, can lead to a mesial temporal kind of hippocampal sclerosis. The patients can have long-term sequela, and uh, they may not improve uh, with treatment. Our next case is a 32-year-old with lupus seizures and end-stage renal disease. Here you see some images from a CT. Uh, you can tell that the CT right away isn't uh, super normal. You've got some areas of hypo intensity uh, or hypodensity rather in the temporal lobe here, for instance. Cerebellum doesn't look so great. It looks a little swollen. Maybe you don't see the fourth ventricle all that well. Additionally, in superior cerebellum, left temporal lobe, maybe even up here in the left MCA distribution, a couple of patchy areas of, uh, of abnormality there. So you want to go ahead and get an MR in this patient to see uh, what's, what's truly going on. Now here you see on a flare, the cerebellum is pretty swollen. Uh, again, you see uh, the hyperintensity is there. This is diffusion in the center here. So you see patchy diffusion abnormalities kind of throughout the cerebellum. Here you see areas of enhancement distributed throughout the cerebellum as well. This is post-contrast. If you can't tell, look for that uh, mucosa of the nasal, uh, nasal passages there. It's enhancing, so you can tell that that's post-contrast. Here you see more flare diffusion and post-contrast just from up a little higher. So you're seeing areas that correspond to the areas of abnormality on CT. So just areas of edema in the occipital lobe, posterior temporal lobe. Uh, you might, uh, you wouldn't be uh, confused for thinking this looks kind of like a press sort of syndrome because you got posterior white matter abnormalities. Up here, the diffusion is a little more normal and the enhancement's a little more normal as well, but you definitely have uh, those, those white matter abnormalities. And you just see more of it as you go higher towards the vertex here. So you're just seeing more in the frontal lobe, maybe interspersed with patchy uh, kind of dots of diffusion, not really much enhancement at this level. Here's your MRA. So you see uh, this shows you two uh, carotids look pretty good. The verts look pretty good. Not a lot to see in terms of vascular abnormalities. So the vasculature is looking pretty good, at least from what you can tell on an MR angiogram. Now, this is a case of encephalitis caused by lupus. And uh, so this patient had lupus and renal failure. Uh, so these patients can get stroke, they can get hemorrhages, they can get dural sinus thrombosis, and then they can sort of get this picture of uh, cerebral vasculitis. And in this case, the, it's kind of a mixed picture here. You have these non-specific white matter abnormalities, but you also have these infarcts. And so in the posterior fossa, particularly, you were seeing infarcts. And this is a small vessel disease, and you may not uh, see that much on an MRA, such as in this case. So the MRA was pretty normal because the vessels which are affected are very small. Now, there's a lot of overlap with press, and I kind of pointed that out as we were going, both in terms of pathology and in terms of the imaging appearance. Patients with lupus are more likely to get press, so it's kind of this overlapping syndrome, and uh, particularly in patients with renal failure and blood pressure abnormalities, you're going to see uh, a lot of overlap. So here's just those images again from the CT. You see those areas of white matter abnormality kind of going to the cortex there, and knowing from the MR what it's going to look like, again, you see flare in the posterior fossa, some enhancement, more flare abnormalities up as you go a little bit higher. So you kind of see this overlapping picture of infarcts and kind of press-like white matter abnormalities. Here's your MRA, which I said is, again, is essentially uh, pretty normal. Our next case is a 60-year-old woman whose status post lung transplant now has I mean, uh, nausea, vomiting, weight loss, and foot drop. So here, uh, kind of similar to the other cases, you see these patchy white matter abnormalities. This is all flare. So you see the hippocampi are not normal here. The uh, dorsal midbrain is not normal. Kind of patchy white matter abnormalities here, uh, again, in the paraventricular white matter. And what may also draw your attention to this is for flare, it doesn't seem like the fluid suppression is really that, uh, isn't really that great. So you're not really getting complete fluid suppression there. Diffusion and post-contrast imaging that go along with this, not a lot going on. The diffusion is pretty normal. The post-contrast is pretty normal there. So this is a case of viral encephalitis, and this patient had had a lung transplant, is immunosuppressed, 
And uh, this is a situation where you get uh, infection and inflammation of the, the brain parenchyma with an infectious etiology. And if you have it involving the cerebral hemispheres, it's called cerebritis. If it involves the cerebellum, it's called cerebellitis. Uh, the causes are commonly inflammatory, uh, viral or, or bacterial, and that can kind of cause this. And we've sort of seen uh, sort of the inflammatory ones. You can definitely get an encephalitis. That's a complication of meningitis as well. Uh, or at least co co associated with meningitis. You saw the findings here. We had some flare hyperintensity. We had uh, we had uh, no enhancement really in this case, although you can uh, have it sometimes. The common causes again, you got to think about herpes, West Nile, St. Louis encephalitis, and many others. Uh, this one had Eastern equine uh, virus uh, isolated from CSF, so that was Eastern equine encephalitis in this case. Although you don't necessarily expect to make that diagnosis by by imaging. Here you see those findings again. You just have these scattered T2 abnormalities. Uh, there's a lot of temporal involvement here, and I uh, have little or no enhancement in this case. Our companion case for this is a 46-year-old with cough and altered mental status. Uh, here you see, uh, again, kind of similar findings, right? So you have a T2, a diffusion, and a coronal flare here. Take a look at that left hippocampus here. So left medial temporal lobe, hippocampus and amygdala very bright on T2, very swollen, loss of the gray white differentiation there. On diffusion, it's very bright, very swollen. And this is just confirmed on flare. You see the medial temporal lobe kind of going up to the sylvian fissure, very swollen and very T2 hyperintense. Here you see the post contrast rather as a kind of a stark contrast to the other ones we've seen so far in this lecture. If you look, there's a little intrinsic T1 hyperintensity, but then very avid enhancement, almost like nodular and kind of fluffy, like cloud-like in the medial temporal lobe there. Very avid enhancement. You see enhancement along the cilia and fissures bilaterally, kind of left worse than right. So a lot of enhancement here. So when you see this much diffusion abnormality, you see this much enhancement, you really need to think about herpes and cephalitis. This you typically get medial temporal lobe involvement, like you saw in this case. In the active stage or the most aggressive stage, you tend to get enhancement. And these patients require urgent treatment with acyclovir. Uh, even if uh, you're unable to do an LP yet, uh, you want to go ahead and start them on acyclovir uh, empirically until it's ruled out, just because the morbidity and mortality are quite high. Here you uh, just confirm those findings so you can review them again. You see this uh, abnormal T2 and flare with a medial predominance. Here you see the enhancement, which we've kind of pointed out. Um, now this patient uh, drastically improved on steroids and uh, there was no other uh, no other cause uh, detected there in the CSF. Uh, so this was uh, herpes encephalitis. Now here's your summary of encephalitis. You can either have an inflammatory or kind of viral encephalitis. They tend to be more bilateral. They tend to be more diffuse. They have less diffusion abnormality, less enhancement, and the patients are less critically ill. And in contrast to herpes where uh, it tends to be asymmetric, Diffusion is abnormal. You can have a lot of enhancement. Those patients tend to be very ill. Now, of all these inflammatory and viral conditions, it can be extremely challenging to tell the difference. So don't necessarily expect on imaging you're going to be able to tell the difference. Just suggest an encephalitis and the clinical picture and clinical testing has the lead uh, to the actual cause. Uh, like I said, a lot of these things look the same. So consider the clinical scenario, core morbidities, and, uh, and the CSF. That concludes this portion, which is on encephalitis. We're going to have uh, four more lectures about the autoimmune and inflammatory conditions of the CNS. So be sure you tune in for those. If you didn't see the MS lecture, then uh, please go back and take a look at that. Uh, click here to subscribe and get uh, alerts on more of our videos. And uh, we hope to have more content coming to you guys soon.